Good morning, First Christian Church. It's good to be together, even in this virtual format, for us to worship with one another. As we get started today, we want to offer a couple of important words of notice to everybody. As you are part of this Christian community, it's good to know what's going on. Next Sunday marks one of a few critical moments in the unfolding future of First Christian Church as we restart another option for worship which is in-person worship and so we'll have the doors open for folks to come and worship with us at nine o'clock or eleven o'clock next sunday morning there are precautions and procedures in place that we'll be taking and so if you come to worship with us tomorrow our next sunday one of the things that you're going to want to know is that you're going to need a face mask and you're going to have your temperature taken when you get here uh, we'll have some folks to guide you through the process once you get here of where to sit and how to come and go from the service. But we want you to know that if you're going to be here, we're taking everyone's safety very seriously. If you want to help uh, get everybody settled and be a greeter and help get people uh, to where they need to be next Sunday morning, we're going to have a training on Tuesday after evening of this week. Uh, it's going to be a 30-minute training August 4th at 6 o'clock over in the Discipleship Center where we can give you everything you need to know to help make sure that ser the services happen smoothly and safely next Sunday morning and moving forward. Uh, want to remind you that every Sunday at 10 a.m. we've been holding Zoom Sunday School and we will continue to hold Sunday School uh, during that time slot. Moving forward, you can find information about that in the Zoom link at our website, fccmckinney.org. I want to remind you that your giving is important, and so we'll be talking about that as an act of worship later on in the surface. But if you're wondering, how do I do that? Well, you can mail it to us here at the church. You can give online on our website, or you can give through the Give Plus mobile app and find First Christian Church of McKinney there. 
A couple of important staff notes today. The first is you're going to notice that I am flying solo as your pastor this morning. Uh, the Reverend Catherine Wright, out of an abundance of caution, is not with us this morning uh, after some potential exposure to someone uh, who may uh, is waiting on test results back regarding COVID-19. And so we want to take that seriously, and we want to model that for you as your church staff, that if you are in a position where you think you might have bumped into somebody, we want you to exercise caution with the folks that you interact with as well. And so we miss her, and uh, hopefully soon we'll have her back in worship with us uh, as we await those results that uh, the folks that she was with are waiting for. Uh, we also want to make a note of gratitude as we start our morning of worship uh, for Riley, who is with us for his last Sunday as our choir director here at First Christian Church. Uh, Riley, the words of gratitude that I have heard about your work here at the church um, have been numerous, and so for your leadership and ministry in a critical time in the music ministry here at First Christian Church, please accept everyone's gratitude and well wishes for the next chapter in your life's journey and with your family. We come before God to worship, to bring praise and gratitude, to, to lay before God the things that we don't know what to do with. And so let's call one another together with our call to worship. Join your hearts in worship, church, to praise God. We bring you praise and listen to God's spirit. Join your voices in worship, church, to praise God. We speak gratitude and sing with joy. Join your gifts, church, to praise God. We mobilize ourselves as one body that through us the gospel may continue to be shared. Let us come before God in song. We worship God this morning, carrying with us uh, the weight of our lives, uh, the potency of our excitement, and the questions of our hearts. And so we come before God to worship, to give thanks, to sing praise, and to pray. Let us come before God in prayer. It's through your spirit, God, that we are called into one. It is the oneness of the church that Jesus establishes and prays for. It is our unity in the spirit of Christ that gives us voice into a world that is broken and divided. And it is in oneness of voice now that we call upon your spirit in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, young and young of heart, young of spirit, and perhaps those who need to be reminded uh, that they are still young in spirit, we gather around right now. If we were all in the same place, we'd ask our young folks to come forward. So maybe young folks scooch closer to your parents' phone or tablet or wherever you're finding yourself being part of worship this morning. Have you noticed that adults are sometimes boring? Sometimes. I mean, not all the time, but sometimes. Like sometimes adults forgot to have fun. They don't have toys anymore. Uh, you know, sometimes we forget to giggle. Sometimes we forget that uh, things are funny. Sometimes we get worried about, you know, like things like bills, which are important. Things like getting to work on time. And believe me, that's important. But sometimes the grown-ups need a reminder from you. Sometimes the grown-ups need to re be reminded that the joy of being a kid, the joy of just living, there's something in fancy pants language divine or something about God wrapped up in that kind of just excitement about life, a new day, a new opportunity. And so we look to you, kids, to remind us that we need to calm down, that we need to look for joy in the everyday. And you bring that to us. And so as your new pastor, I am grateful that we have kids in this church who are going to constantly remind us of what it means to be together and have fun and enjoy each other and find some toys and play together. Let's pray. God, bless our hearts through the gifts of your children, our children, and the call to life that we're given, that we might come before you as like children as well. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Now, the things that we carry with us that we don't know what to do with, and the things we carry with us, oh, that bring us a sense of the weight of life. The things we carry with us that, you know, just make us pretty happy. We bring all of this before God in our moments of prayer. I want to remind you that you have opportunities to share the things that you're praying for with your church family. You can do that at fccmckinney.org through the prayer um, template form there on our website. Click on prayers and it'll take you to a spot to type up what it is you'd like somebody to pray for and who it is you'd like that to go to. Uh, we gather all of these things together and pray for them throughout the week and each Sunday as we worship. If you want to find our compiled list of our prayers, you can find that in your e-bulletin at fccmckinney.org as well. We come before God because we know there is strength in what it means to humble ourselves in honesty and in faithfulness to God's spirit. And so we do that just now. Let's pray together, church. God, shape us by the power of your spirit. We lay ourselves before you in worship. We come before your presence. And we know that we have tried to be too in charge of too many things for too long, and it's not working. And so we soften our hearts and quiet our voices of command and direction and release our grip that we have held tightly onto things that we thought we were in charge of. And we yield ourselves in malleability to your spirit. God, we pray for those who are hurting, who need to be need to be touched by your comfort. We pray for those who are lonely and isolated that need the gift of companionship. God, we pray for those who suffer under systems of oppression and injustice, who long for the liberation that you intend for all of your children. And we pray that you would use us as followers of Jesus and as your activated church in the world to do the work that dignifies all of your children with the freedom they long for. 
We give you thanks that in Christ we know your forgiveness, your reconciling power, and your mercy. But may it be that it is more than something we receive. God, we pray that as the church, we are conduits of your good news, of your compassion into the world. There has never been a more broken time, a more desperate time than right now. There has never been a better moment for the church to be about the business of proclaiming good news, forgiveness, unity. God, use our voices, use our actions, our hands and feet to be that work in the world on your behalf. God, we pray for the needs of those that we love. For those situations that weigh heavy on our hearts that we wish were different that we wish we could change. We pray for patience. We pray for creativity. God, we pray for joy as perhaps a silver lining in moments that have been hard. Strengthen us to speak love into a world so desperately in need of it. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We are reading this morning from the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. We're going to pick up at verse 7 and read through verse 12. And it goes like this. On the first day of the week, when we had met to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them. Since he intended to leave the next day, he continued speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room upstairs where we were meeting. A young man named Eutychus, who was sitting in the window, began to sink off into a deep sleep while Paul talked still longer. Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three floors below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and, bending over him, took him in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, for life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs, and after he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn. Then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comforted. Now, sure, this is an exciting story of resurrection or resuscitation, but it is also an important cautionary tale to preachers everywhere that if you drone on too long, people are going to find a way to get out of your service. It's a cautionary tale to preachers everywhere to read the room, you know, take the temperature, so to speak, and pay attention that you are engaging and that people are, you know, still with you. It's a story about not being in tune with your community. I'm sure it's powerful that this little guy, Eutychus, was brought back to life, but it was a preventable death and resurrection if Paul had paid just a bit more attention to what was going on around him. It's a story of him being singularly focused on the only thing he was there to do. Now, I kind of blame him as the preacher for being... Oh, a little too focused on self, as Paul is wont to do. And more focused on self than on the whole of the body. More focused on the individual than the community. And being overly focused on the individual and not on the community is not the church. It's not how we're intended to function and focus and be at work with one another. And we're guilty of this ourselves in our own time and place. Perhaps no preacher in the history of this church has ever droned on so long that someone fell asleep and out a window from an upper floor and died. But still, preachers and church folk are guilty of not rallying ourselves appropriately around what it means to share an experience in Jesus Christ. And we've neglected Christ-centered Christian community sometimes for the sake of personal preference sometimes peripheral personal preference. But that's not the church either. 
And what happens then is we stack on and stack on our own personal preferences into the center of identity of a, of a congregation or our understanding of a congregation. We stack on and on our own personal preferences or even our collective preferences and sometimes make that just as central to who we are as what it means to follow Jesus. And that's not the church. And when we do that, it becomes more and more difficult for us to share Christian community with people whose personal preferences don't match our own. It makes it harder and harder for us to share Christian community with people whose political leanings are different than ours, whose, whose cultural understandings, whose household makeup, right? You can fill in the blanks of all the ways that our lives are different. And sometimes if we make all of those things central to the church, just like we make faith in Jesus Christ central to the church, it makes it difficult for us to be in Christian community with people whose lives don't look like ours. And so, what do we do? Well, we have what it takes. We have what it takes to sort of avoid this trap that the preacher in this morning's passage falls into, to not be overly focused on just one thing. How to pay attention to one another. We've got what it takes to build community. We've got what it takes to rally around this central idea of our shared faith in Jesus Christ. You know, you've done it before. We know how to build community, even temporary community. You've been at the football game when people who are cheering for the same team you are are sitting around you, but you don't know these people. But when your team scores the big play, scores the goal, right? You start high-fiving with people you have never met before in your life. Because you have that shared moment, that shared experience. We know how to share experience and build community, temporary or long-standing. It's just that sometimes we forget to seek that kind of common ground in the church. We forget to rally around just that one thing that we have, our faith in Jesus Christ, and we bring in these other peripheral personal preferences and use those to mark what it means to be part of Christian community but that's not the church. Now, I have a seven-year-old son, Will. What's up, buddy? He's in Colorado right now at his grandparents. And he has a set of bunk beds. It used to be bunk beds, and then we sort of did our own at-home engineering, and we took out the bottom bunk, so now it's just a lofted upper bunk, and we've got some play space down underneath. And after we moved into our home here in McKinney, he decided what he needed was a pulley system to lug things in a bucket from the floor that, you know, that lengthy and unwieldy, six feet all the way up to where his top bunk was. And so we went to a local home improvement store to buy all the things that we needed to put in this very important bucket pulley system. We got our rope and our pulley and our bucket and our clamps and clips and we stood in line to make our purchase, and there we were in the garden center. You know, all the home improvement stores kind of have these outdoor garden centers wrapped in chain link fence, and if you're lucky, you can find a shorter checkout line out there, and so that's what we did. And so there we are in line in the garden center of the home improvement store, and it's me and Will, and then six feet in front of us, the next person in line. Uh, is a 60-something Middle Eastern couple. And then just ahead of them is our, is our cashier, an African-American gentleman, probably, I don't know, 20. And there we all are, waiting to make our purchases, cashiers waiting to use a little Zappy McGee to ring up what we're buying. When we're brought together in this beautiful moment of unity, when scurrying right along the ground in front of us is a rat. So this rat, right, he's doing his little job now. So he, he goes out because there, there was a hose hooked up. You know, they need to water all those plants they're trying to sell you. They can't exactly sell you dead plants. And so they had a hose hooked up out there, and the hose was leaking just a little bit and forming a little pool that the rat found awful appetizing to satisfy his or her rat thirst. And so the rat scurries along. I mean, not really in any hurry, unworried by us. And it's just taking his little rat drinks. And so there is this beautiful moment of shared experience. And there, there's me and my seven-year-old son staring in like, oh, cool. And there's the gentleman in front of me staring in like, oh, cool. His wife quickly exited the scene. There's the cashier staring over at the same rat, at the same puddle from the same leaky faucet, doing the same thing. Myself, my son, the gentleman in front of me are all doing. 
And there we all were, sort of all little boys at heart. And so we made our purchase and we're walking out to the car and in my head I'm thinking, oh, ain't that America? Isn't that beautiful? These people from all of these different backgrounds and stations in life sharing this experience of a rat getting a drink of water in the garden center of the home improvement store. God bless America. You know, and we had this moment and we're all chuckling together and the gentleman in front of me is laughing at his wife who didn't want to be anywhere near the rat. Now, surely though, surely the table and cross of Christ is more potent and powerful as a rallying point for the church than a rat in the garden center at the home improvement store. Surely there is something more potent and powerful in what we share in our professed faith in Jesus Christ that can draw us together into one body and help us de-emphasize those peripheral personal preferences that sometimes overtake the church and put us on the wrong track. Surely the table and cross of Christ is enough to be our rallying point and bring us to life for people of different backgrounds and places and stations in life to become one body. Surely that's enough, right? Surely the rat, the home improvement store garden center, doesn't have more power to bring people together than Jesus. And so we've got to be careful about the need to overcomplicate. The need to unnecessarily narrow our scope more and more and more into what it means to be the church. Because what happens is when we bring in all those peripheral personal preferences and stack them on and stack them on and stack them on, it makes it harder and harder for us to connect with folks that don't look like that set of personal preferences. When we don't pay enough attention to other people and their own backgrounds and life experiences and what brings them into life in the church, when we are not aware enough of reading the room and paying attention to who is part of this body, like the preacher in this morning's story our message doesn't register. Our message doesn't register and people begin to kind of drift off. Fall away. And so the neglect of Christ-centered community needs to be at the forefront of our mind. That's a cautionary tale of this morning's passage from this 20th chapter of Acts. It's a cautionary tale to stay really focused on one another that mutual encouragement that we talked about a few weeks ago that draws us and draws one another back toward this central feature of our church, which is our shared faith in Jesus Christ. It's easy for us to become like the preacher in this morning's story, overly focused on self to such a degree that people are drifting off and falling away. We need to remember that we have something powerful and potent enough at the center of who we are to make all of our varied backgrounds and preferences important as a feature of diversity, but not so much that they are a singular point of our identity, because Jesus is that. So what do we do to recenter us? How do we kind of, okay, rattle the brain loose, all right, get back to the basics, What kind of things give us the hospitality and welcome that bring people in rather than watch them fall away? Well, I have a couple of thoughts. Who's ready? Now, if you were in the room, everybody would stare at me. I would say, who's ready? And you would all stare at me with blank looks. And then I would have to say, okay, I ask a question. Now, please respond. Who's ready? And then you would be like, I am, Peter. I can't wait. Tell us. Okay, I'm going to. What's going to move us there? Well, a couple of things. The first is attendance. Now, I know that this instruction is a little weird in our current time and place. Next Sunday, when we start to regather for worship, some are ready to be here and some are reluctant to re-enter the church building for corporate worship, and I totally get that. But in whatever way you can, online or in person, attend, make church a priority. Be present to your church community in whatever way is available to you. I, I would specify this, too, to know sort of the breadth of your church. And so if you typically come to the 11 o'clock service, I would give you the word of encouragement to, from time to time, just on occasion, go to the other building, 
go to the Discipleship Center and stick your head in on the 9 o'clock service and see what's going on there. See how members of your church family are connecting with God in worship in a format different than this one. I told them the same thing at the 9 o'clock service. So I hope from time to time you in this service might see them peek their head in, come sit in on worship in a format of worship different than what those folks typically attend. Now, it may not be your preferred method, but it gives you insight into the breadth and diversity of the folks and perspectives that make up your church. Now, some of you might say, as I have had said to me over the many years of ministry where I have done work in a multi-service setting, I have heard the voices say, the very insistent, very, 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 hmm, I just can't, I just can't go to a service with drums. Or I'm not going to go sing out of the hymnal. And if you cannot, for a moment, go attend a service whose format is different than what you prefer, I would give you the encouragement to really sit down with God regarding the sin of pride. Because for my entire career, I have served churches with multiple ways of worship and multiple formats and styles for worship. And churches with pastors like yours, right? I have sat through multiple services of varying formats, many, 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 many Sundays for many years. And I can tell you without exception, God is praised in all of them. People are drawn to the power of the gospel in all of them. People lay themselves to be uh, reshaped by the power of the Holy Spirit in all types and forms of worship. And so I encourage you to understand how God might move in ways that are different than what you're used to. I encourage you to give invitation. Right, Inviting people to join you in worship shifts your focus away from the insular and to the outside world of folks who need a connection with God. Invite somebody to join you in worship because there is desperate need, right? It is very hard to be alive in 2020, right? It is weird, weird, weird. And people are struggling and parents are stressed out and there is just weight that everyone is carrying. And imagine what the invitation to connect with God, to join in Christian community, to be in a place where you can find some belonging. What might that mean for a person? Specifically, You don't even have to invite somebody to the service that you go to. Perhaps you've got a neighbor who's much younger than you that you think, I don't want to come to my 11 o'clock service. Great, don't invite them to the 11 o'clock service. Invite them to the 9 o'clock service and vice versa. It's not about them being with you. It's about folks being connected to the wider body of the church. And so give those words of invitation. I promise you they will begin to rewire your brain about how you understand the purpose and reach of Christian community. Take seriously your giving, because the giving that you do to your local congregation makes possible a whole breadth of ministry that you might not even participate in yourself. My household has been a tithing household for the last 15 years since we've been married, and tithing is a biblical practice that says that 10% of everything that comes into our household goes back out to the work of the local church. And so every month, For as long as we've been married, Annalisa and I have been writing those checks to whatever church that we have been involved in at that time. right? Because the the tithe goes to the local church, not to the project I'm interested in, not to the ministry area that my kids participate in, not to the service that I prefer to go to. The tithe goes to the local church. And what that does is provide robust ministry that connects with people in all sorts of places and facets of life. Right, and I, don't you want a robust ministry in your church? Don't you want an outreach program and mission trips and Sunday school for kids and a choir and bells and worship and and infrastructure of staff that does the administration? I mean, don't we want all of those things that bring the church to life? And, And so if you can begin to rewire your giving, and particularly I would call you to the invitation to tithe as a biblical practice to your local church that supports the ministry all of the ministry of that local church, I can tell you personally that it gives me insight and appreciation for the breadth of ministry that churches conduct when I'm not just giving to this thing or that thing, but to the work and purpose of the whole church. It breaks down my personal preferences and keeps me centered on the goal that we're after. Decide to learn. The next couple of months, probably shoot, the next year, 
we're going to be slowly, slowly re-engaging some versions of life that we used to know together. And it's going to give you the opportunity to reconnect with people. And there might be some people that, gosh, I didn't really even know you that well before, and I kind of forgot your name. Great. Introduce yourself. Just stick out that elbow for the elbow bump of Christ. I think that's what they call it. Um, don't shake hands. Just reintroduce yourself. Say, I, I know we know each other. I just want to get reacquainted. My name is Peter. Ask people about themselves. People you don't already know. Find out what service they go to. Find out about the places where they connect in the church. Get to know people. Just go out of your way. I know you're like, oh, Peter, I don't want to talk to strangers. They told me in kindergarten not to do that. It's okay at church. Talk to strangers. Go out of your way to learn about the folks that share in this church with you. And finally, I want to tell you to, to consider the Pentecost. If you're familiar with much earlier in the book of Acts, the second chapter, we get the story of the Pentecost, right? And all these folks are in Jerusalem from all parts of the world, and uh, the Holy Spirit shows up, and it's what's called the birth of the church, and like tongues of flame, which is kind of fun, the Holy Spirit descends, and suddenly folks who are all speaking different languages, the church is born into life when those language barriers come down. And it's important to note, they don't all get the same language, the birth of the church is not uniformity. They're just able to understand the languages of the folks around them. It's this multilingual situation. It is this diverse and complex gathering of people that is the birth of the church. It's not uniformity. And that's important for us to remember. That when the Holy Spirit descends again and again and calls the church back to life again and again... It does so hopefully with diverse voices and languages, and we may not speak the same language, but the Spirit of God gives us insight to better understand one another when we're coming from different places, with different perspectives or personal preferences. The temptation is strong and often unnoticeable. We're not even necessarily aware that it's what we're doing when we pile on these preferences and get so narrowly focused, forgetting to read the room and pay attention to the folks around us. It's, it's hard to avoid, and we don't necessarily know it's the path that we're on, which is why we have to work so hard to avoid practices like the preacher in today's story. Where we have to pay attention with things like giving and attending and intentional relationship paying attention to the folks who are around us whose lives don't look like ours and giving thanks that those folks are a part of our church life. Because when we avoid it, when we don't do that intentional work, whether we like it or not, when we don't do enough to notice others, they begin to sort of drift off, fall away. At this table, we have to remember that in our tradition, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and here at First Christian Church at this table is the gracious invitation of Christ and we, we celebrate an open table. We welcome all to God's table just as God has welcomed us. It's a gracious invitation from Jesus that we celebrate at the table and it's important for us to know that if we say that everybody is welcome at this table then we need to take a hard look at ourselves to make sure that we are adjusting our behaviors accordingly to match. The full life of the church is here at this table. The full life of the church is in our shared faith in Jesus Christ, which isn't always a uniform experience. There will still be different voices, but hopefully our patience and faithfulness gives us ears to understand. The full life of Christ and the full life of the church is in our humility and in our hospitality to pay close attention to one another, that none may fall asleep and drift off, that none may fall away. Amen. We gather at a table a table that memorializes Jesus the Christ. 
Surely that table, surely the cross and the empty tomb evidence of resurrection of Christ is enough to draw us into shared life, to be the rallying point that propels us forward and into our community to share the good news of the power and restorative love of God made known in Jesus. And so as we come before this table, as we share in the elements that you have at home, know that it is enough and it is drawing you and your church to life. As we break the bread and share the cup, as we prepare ourselves to receive these gifts of God, may we give thanks. Let us sing. Lift us up, Lord. Lead us beside the still water that calms our fears. Hold us, Lord, in the palm of your hand and let us know the peace of your love and the hope of your light through these symbols of bread and juice. We look to you in times of trouble and stress. We know that we should be strong, but our strength fails us. We flounder and our thoughts turn to despair. Teach us, Lord, to trust in you as we come to this table. Teach us to believe in your love, your hope through these dark days. Teach us to have faith when we cannot see the end. Hold us up, Lord, and carry us in your love. Amen. Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and broke it. Giving thanks, he offered it to those who were gathered with him in an upper room and said, Take and eat, this is my body broken for you. Likewise with the cup, lifting it before them, saying that that cup was his blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. To take and drink. And so now in this meal, we do the same with whatever elements you have with you as we memorialize the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ until he comes again.
We offer our gifts before God as an act of worship. They are collected from many sources, many individuals and households that when gathered and blessed as one, become empowered by the work of the Spirit. And so as an act of worship and in response to God's generosity in our own lives, we offer these gifts and pray God's blessing upon them. Father God, you are the giver of life and all good things, and your word makes it clear that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We ask that you accept these gifts and use them to your glory. May these gifts bring shelter to the homeless, comfort to the sick, rest to the weary, and hope to the hopeless. Just as you multiplied the offering of fish and the loaves that were freely given for others, we pray that you would multiply these offerings to you and accomplish with them more than we could ask or imagine. We give freely and not because we have to, for there is nothing we could give that matches your glory and majesty and the great gift of your son Jesus and the Holy Spirit which guides us daily. All we have is yours, Father, and we ask that you would use us and all we have as you will. Amen. Amen. We offer the word of invitation that if connectivity here with this congregation has been meaningful for you and you'd like to establish First Christian Church of McKinney as your church home, uh, to reach out to us through the, um, the prayer tab on our website, fccmckinney.org. If you'd like to proclaim faith in Jesus Christ for the first time, we gladly welcome that as well and celebrate that with you. And you can reach out to us in just the same way as we welcome you into the family life of this congregation. Friends, we come together before God in our final hymn, this hymn of invitation. And so let's raise our voices in song.
Under the Lordship of Jesus, may it be that we go forth from worship, compelled to do good in the world, compelled to be conduit of the love of God, compelled to be conduit of the blessing that we have received as part of this Christian community. May we center ourselves on Christ and to do Christ's work in the world. Church, go in peace.